I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today about a subject that's pretty important to many of us in cottage country and for which I have a personal interest, enhanced wake sports. I live on a small lake in Halliburton County and enhanced wake sports have over the last five years or so really started to take a toll on our lake and on our ability to enjoy it. When we talk about the impacts of enhanced wake sports on the lake, you'll often hear talk about lake health, lake ecology and the importance of both. But I felt like we needed a new perspective. So today I'm going to frame enhanced wake activities in the context of the natural history of our lakes and how they age through time to help emphasize the truly dramatic effect these boats can have. So I'll start with a very brief reminder of where our lakes originated. Roughly 11,000 years ago, the ice sheet that covered much of Canada was retreating from southern and central Ontario. This retreating ice exposed hundreds of thousands of geological and glacially carved depressions in the landscape that quickly filled with water, and Ontario lakes were born. Having been covered by ice for over two million years, you can imagine at this time that these lakes would have been devoid of any organic matter or nutrients, and that they supported very little life in or around them. There are many contemporary examples of very young lakes like this today around the margin of the Greenland ice sheet and in the Rocky Mountains, for example. From here, these glacier lakes began a natural succession that would take many thousands of years. Young, nutrient-poor lakes like these are called the ligotrophic lakes, and they're characterized by deep, clear water, scant vegetation and algae, and high oxygen levels. Over many thousands of years, natural processes like erosion and decomposition cause sediments and nutrients to accumulate in the lakes. This encourages plant and animal growth, which in turn leads to more nutrient accumulation and so on. It's a positive feedback cycle. Over time, the clarity of the water starts to decrease and lakes become able to support a diverse ecosystem of aquatic plants and fish. Lakes at this state of succession are classified as mesotrophic. Many lakes in cottage country are mesotrophic, including Lake of Bays and My Lake in Halliburton, for example. This process of accumulating nutrients and increasing productivity is called eutrophication, and we can liken eutrophication to the process of lake aging. Keep in mind, though, that this occurs gradually over thousands of years, and in fact, 11,000 years after the formation of our lakes, we still have many nutrient-poor oligotrophic lakes in cottage country like Lake Joseph and Skeleton Lake. Eventually, though, with enough time, aging lakes become eutrophic with high nutrient levels and high productivity, characterized by excessive plant and algae growth, reduced water clarity, and low oxygen. It's important to point out here that while we often think of eutrophic lake as an unhealthy lake, this isn't necessarily the case. Eutrophication can be the natural state of a lake that's approaching the end of its life. They are important ecosystems in their own right, but typically, these lakes aren't great for human recreation, and thus we don't tend to build our cottages on them. If your lake suddenly became eutrophic, you would rightfully think that your lake's health was very poor indeed. So humans, unsurprisingly, can contribute significantly to this eutrophication process with our septic systems, fertilized lawns and gardens, our removal of vegetation, hardening of shorelines, and activities that cause shoreline erosion. Through these activities, we are able to dramatically increase the input of nutrients into a lake, accelerating this natural lake aging process. When this is driven by our activities rather than natural processes, we call this cultural eutrophication. And it turns out that we can achieve the equivalent of thousands of years of natural eutrophication over very short periods of time. So when we talk about lake health and cottage country, what we're really talking about is minimizing or preventing this cultural eutrophication. Now, this of course isn't new. We know the potential effects of human activity on lakes, and so we mitigate for these impacts by regulating and inspecting septic systems. We protect watersheds with governing authorities, and we have shoreline protection bylaws to maintain the integrity of the ribbon of life around our lakes that help buffer the effects of human activity on shore. And we've proven that we can do a reasonably good job of this, minimizing the impact of our activities and controlling cultural eutrophication. So enter enhanced wakes and enhanced wake boats. These boats are specifically designed or modified with ballast and mechanical devices to create significantly more powerful waves than traditional recreational boats. So let's put this into context. Even in the Great Lakes, waves powerful enough to surf are only generated during the biggest winter storms, and yet we're now regularly bringing these ocean waves to our cottage country lakes. In my opinion, these boats and their wake 
are the most significant human impact on our lake since their formation 11,000 years ago. And they have the potential to very quickly undo all that we have achieved in minimizing cultural eutrophication of our lakes. So specifically, how are these boats so impactful? To date, a significant volume of research has been undertaken about the impact of these boats, and the science is pretty clear in this regard. Now, there's a lot going on in this figure, but I want you to focus primarily on two elements that greatly impact the eutrophication of our legs. The first is the effect of the downward pro pointing prop wash resulting from the high angle of attack when these boats are in wake surfing mode. This wash can reach depths of up to nine meters, uprooting vegetation, destroying fish habitat, stirring up sediment, and adding nutrients to the water column. The second, of course, is the boat wake itself. They can reach heights of over a meter. When these waves reach shore, they can still be quite large, dramatically eroding shorelines, also stirring up bottom sediments, and further contributing to suspended nutrients in the water column. Then there is, of course, the contribution to the spread of invasive species via the ballast tanks, the safety element for other lake users, damage to property and infrastructure, and the disruption of important wildlife habitat like loon nesting areas and fish spawning in nursery grounds. But what can we do about it? Well, we clearly need to act fast. As with other human activities that can contribute to lake eutrophication, we need to act in order to minimize its effects. But how? Does this mean an outright ban? Well, no. While an outright ban would solve the problem, there are undeniably circumstances where enhanced wakes will have a manageable impact. For example, in large lakes, where natural waves can be of comparable size, or where there's room for wake energy to dissipate before reaching shore. And what about education? Well, education is undeniably important, and organizations like Safe Quiet Lakes have undertaken important work in this regard, but we categorically cannot educate our way out of this problem. Education works best when combined with regulation, particularly when it comes to complex issues like vehicular operation. The compromise, of course, is to implement operational limitations based on our current understanding of the societal and environmental impacts of enhanced wake activities, together with, uh, with education and ultimately achieving sustainable usage. So regulating for sustainable usage, where enhanced wake boats are permitted but in such a way as to minimize negative impacts, must be based on science with clear objectives to minimize contributions to cultural eutrophication and reduce other environmental impacts as well as safety and property damage concerns. While ample research has been undertaken on the impacts of enhanced wake, more research is needed to parameterize sustainable usage in the many different settings where these boats are operated. However, one thing is very clear. Proximity to the lake bottom and to the shore is of overwhelming importance. Thus, we already have two key parameters we must use for regulating sustainable usage, minimum operation depth and minimum distance from shore. In the case of minimum depths, the effects of prop wash on lake bottoms is pretty clear and the science is broadly in agreement. Without a doubt, enhanced wake activities are incompatible with and unsustainable in shallow waters. Minimum depths of six meters are required for safe operation. But in cottage countries, fragile ecosystems, especially in the vicinity of spawning beds, fish nursery areas, and other wildlife habitat, a minimum operational depth of nine meters is justified. In the case of minimum distance from shore, current recommendations in the literature vary pretty widely. For example, I've seen some boating industry funded research that recommends a minimum operating distance of 200 feet from shore, which is about 60 meters. Compare this to minimum distance recommendations in the scientific literature that range from 200 to 250 meters and up. However, these minimum operating distances come with a caveat here since safe distance will be highly dependent on local conditions, in particular shoreline and bottom characteristics. To me, cottage country lakes are characterized by thin soil, fragile shoreline vegetation, sensitive ecosystems, and are highly vulnerable to cultural eutrophication, so we need to be considering minimum distances closer to 500 meters. It occurred to me while researching this issue that I didn't really have a good sense of what different operational distances would look like for different lakes. So I undertook a buffer analysis for all the lakes in Ontario and Quebec to illustrate what this would look like. And I thought it might be helpful to show some of these results to you now. So here we have a map of Lake Joseph, Lake Rosso, and the other lakes in the area. And on this map, we can overlay the areas of the lakes that are at least the indicated buffer distance from shore. So here we have 250 meters, 400 meters, 
500 meters, and all of them together. And now Lake Muskoka, 250 meters, 400 meters, 500 meters, and all of them together. The areas highlighted by these rainbow colors are those areas of the lake that are most compatible with enhanced wake activities. So going forward, there are many issues yet to consider. For example, does the time of year matter when talking about the impact of enhanced wakes? Do we need to think about how impacts change at spring high water or at autumn low water? What about critical seasons for algae blooms and wildlife? We also need to understand that every lake is different and that sustainable solutions might in some cases need to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Finally, how can we best exploit technological solutions such as sat-nav like phone apps, indicating surf zones, and real-time depth monitors to inform boat operators? So to conclude, there is a compromise where we can allow enhanced wake activities to operate, but in a measured fashion so as to minimize their contribution to cultural eutrophication and to keep our lakes in their youthful and pristine states for as long as possible. Thanks for listening.